So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, where I'll be covering uh, some recent developments uh, in Kubernetes and, and within GK for um, overload pr protection and, and prevention of um, um, various uh, denial of service um, scenarios that we've been working on. Uh, so, firstly, just a little bit about myself. Um, obviously, I, I work on GKE, and I joined Google about uh, two years ago. Um, prior to working at Google, I've been I've been working on uh, Kubernetes uh, for about uh, five to six years at this point. Uh, so, over the years, I've worked on um, many areas of the, of the code base, uh, but more recently, I've been uh, uh, working uh, on some areas uh, in Kube API Server, specifically around. Uh, API priority and fairness, and kind of trying to operationalize this uh, subsystem within GKE. Um, and so th that'll be uh, the focus for most of the talk. Um, but before we go there, it's worth just kind of mentioning kind of the different types of uh, denial of service that a Kubernetes cluster can experience. And I'm sure there's been like tons of talks about how you can break your cluster and, and, and whatnot. Um, and so many times when we think about like denial of service attacks, we think about you know, uh, uh, bots flooding your network with millions of packets per second, or we think about, you know, security vulnerabilities being exploited at scale. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, like, these types of attacks do happen, but luckily for um, myself and the, the, the other engineers that work on GKE, we leverage uh, many of Google's um, common infrastructure and services. And so out of the box, we get pretty good protection for, for those types of um, attacks at like really large scale. Um, and yeah, it turns out, you know, Google, Google infrastructure is fairly good at this kind of thing. So uh, many of these uh, denial of service attacks um, not, like, don't end up really being my problem, right? They're kind of like handled at a more like common infrastructure layer and there's really smart teams of engineers that kind of work on on, on these kind of things for, for our networks and, and, and our servers at Google. And yeah, there's like tons of uh, recent blog posts around these kind of topics. The most recent one around um, the HTTP2 rapid reset. Uh, that was a pretty cool blog post, which I, I recommend um, you check it out if you haven't. Um, so from GK's perspective, the types of denial of service that we need to mainly be concerned with is uh, denial of service at the application layer, or in this case, the application being like Kubernetes or specifically the, the Kube API server. Um, so if you think about like the possible types of um, denial of service that like Kube API server can experience, it, we can very broadly break it down into kind of two categories. The first is, um, you know, you, you, the, a bad actor kind of gets access to Kube API server and it starts kind of exploiting um, some like known bugs or performance characteristics about the system and then tries to take down the API server. Um, but you can argue this is like very similar to basically like security exploit, right? Like if, if such a bug um, was known, we would probably treat it like a CVE and like go through the standard, you know, process to like quickly roll out CVE fixes. So I'm not gonna really touch on that topic all too much. Um, and the second is, is a user that is like unknowingly causing a denial of service scenario in their cluster. And for this talk, I'll be kind of mostly um, talking about those kind of scenarios. And if you think about it, it's actually not uh, that surprising, like especially if you have like really, really large um, GK clusters that are shared across uh, many engineering teams, it's, it's not uncommon to see um, these types of scenarios kind of happening. Uh, so yeah, let's let's go through some uh, one example that's not uh, that's not uncommon uh, for GKE. Uh, so let's say you have like a, you have a five thousand node cluster uh, in your organization. You know, so it's shared across like many many engineering teams in, in, in your big organization, and you know one team maybe it's the monitoring team or uh, some other team they they need to uh, they want to like deploy this this new daemon set. Um, and so for starters, like already this daemon set is gonna run on every single node in your 5,000 node cluster. So you're, you're basically running 5,000 replicas of this thing. And yeah, let's say the purpose of this daemon set is, is for monitoring. So the first thing it does is it needs to find, uh, for every single replica, it needs to find every pod that is running locally on the same node. And then it uses the pod's IP and the status to, to scrape the metrics endpoint. And then it pushes it into like a centralized place so you can you know, use for your dashboards and whatever. And then let's say this daemon set 
uh, doesn't follow like all the best practices about Kubernetes scalability. So it doesn't use the list watch pattern to fetch objects. It doesn't use informers. And it, instead, what it does, it, like, it has this like for loop where it'll just like periodically list the objects that it cares about. Uh, and then even worse, let's say you know, it doesn't specify a resource version. So uh, basically, API server, every time it sees this request, it needs to get all the, the objects from etcd to get the latest version. Um, and then as the kind of the final nail in the coffin, uh, it'll use like a field selector uh, to filter pods based on um, pods that are on the same node, which actually requires API server to fetch all pods from etcd because it actually doesn't support uh, filtering like etcd objects based on, on, on specific fields. Um, so yeah, you can imagine like th this type of uh, scenario can like really quickly snowball into like a full outage, right? Especially if you have like 5,000 of these clients like the kind of just being deployed at once. And like, like I make this kind of sound like a hypothetical scenario, but it actually happens uh, like quite frequently. So like even for kind of like well-known third-party packages or third-party add-ons um, provided by vendors, like it, it's not uncommon to kind of um, see these, these, uh, these, types of, these types of clients. Um, and so the goal for Kubernetes is to make it like we want to make Kubernetes resilient enough so that in these types of scenarios, it can kind of automatically protect itself and preserve like specific capacity to uh, handle or to be able to run like the, the core system components. Um, so if we, if we kind of uh, take a step back and look at the, the history of Kubernetes, the very first uh, mechanism that we introduced was basically uh, two flags in the API server the max requests in flight and the, the max mutating requests in flight. And these two flags basically provided limits for the maximum amount of um, read and write requests that you can process at any given time. Um, and in GKE, the, the first thing we had to do was we had to basically like operationalize these, uh, these flags in our fleet. Um, and the tricky thing is like you can't just like pick one value and just have it work for the whole fleet. We have to basically uh, tune this value so that it's appropriate based on the capacity that a, that a cluster has. Um, if you pick a value too low, you risk kind of preemptively um, throttling your clients excessively, and you end up with like unused capacity in your cluster. And if you set the value too high, you risk basically like overload, like diluting the protection and then completely overloading your control plane. Um, so what we started with initially was very implementation. So th these are kind of just like made up numbers. The, the exact numbers aren't really that important. But we basically use like a linear function where for every uh, CPU core we give uh, for the control plane, we, add, we would add 10 max and flight requests for each core. Um, and uh, this actually, this approach actually got us pretty far. Like it actually worked fairly well. But then it, it kind of started to have some limitations. And so. Uh, the, the, obvious, the, the obvious big limitation is that like, there's no concept of prioritization. So you, you can still have like, complete overload situations just by like, a handful of clients. Or in extreme cases, like, even one client can basically use up all your max and flight requests and basically make your, uh, brick your cluster and, and take it down. And so th this was obviously a problem. And we, we, we want like, the overall availability of the system to be a little bit more robust. Uh, and so this is where um, APF comes into play. Uh, but yeah, really quickly before I go into details, I do, I do want to call out um, some of the folks who've been driving this effort for, for multiple releases. I, I think in uh, 129, which is the upcoming release, we're actually planning to uh, promote the um, API prior priority and fairness uh, feature to GA. So that'll be a huge milestone for the team. Um, these folks have been working on it for, I think, almost like 12 releases now. So a huge milestone. And uh, my main contribution in this area is mostly um, figuring out how to operationalize uh, this in GKE and kind of just like uh, throwing some bugs over the wall to them. So they, they did the hard work, really. Um, so yeah, like in the very initial implementations of APF, we basically had um, this system to define priority levels. And then within each priority level, uh, API server is like managing queues to basically determine like how much available capacity is left and whether it should either accept or drop new new requests. Um, so so now we have some guarantee in high load scenarios. Uh, basically, like when we when API server gets overloaded, we can be uh, confident that you know some requests are reserved for the kubelet, some requests are reserved for the scheduler, and 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 whatnot. 
And basically how we achieved this was we introduced a new API group, flowcontrol.kubernetes.io, which basically introduced uh, two APIs, the priority level configuration and the flow schema. So really quick recap for those who aren't familiar. Um, priority level configuration defines limits on the number of outstanding requests and limitations on the number of queued requests. And the flow schema is basically how you classify requests into those uh, priority levels. Uh, so with the uh, introduction of APF, the kind of the first immediate problem that we needed to, needed to address was that each request was basically treated as one seat inside the APF queues. Um, and, and this was the case when the feature graduated to beta in, in 1.20. But the problem is that in reality, the amount of actual work that API server needs to do to process these um, requests actually varies like, significantly. Um, so it was important for us to have some kind of uh, way to associate like a more accurate cost to these requests and then apply it to the amount of seats that we're taking up in these, in these queues. Uh, so over many releases, we introduced some heuristics to try to estimate the amount of work involved in a request. Um, so th this was actually uh, pretty, like it, it was uh, not that hard to implement because we actually had very, um, uh, we had the basic parameters all available in the request metadata. The problem is really figuring out like what are the actual right numbers um, that can achieve this. So for single object get, those still cost one seat, which makes sense because we, uh, in the worst case scenario, we fetch the single object from etcd and then we have to serialize the object and then return it to client and all that. Um, if we look at a, a list request, um, this could potentially list um, uh, all objects of a resource in the cluster. So the, uh, the amount of the cost has to be some function of the amount of objects that we're going to potentially list. Uh, in addition, um, we actually have to double the cost if we list from storage in, instead of cache. Um, and we can actually determine this based on the, the resource version of, of the request. Um, so the, the formula for estimating a uh, list request is uh, n divided by 100 uh, times 2 if resource version, um, or, it, or it, times 2 if it's basically, resource, resource version is not 0, so it was uh, listed from uh, storage, and where n is the number of objects that, uh, uh, that's in storage. Uh, so watch is similar, but, but slightly different. Uh, if watch request specifies uh, send initial events, then we treat it like a list from cache, because that's, that's effectively what it's doing. Otherwise, we treat it as just costing one seat. Um, mutating requests, which includes uh, you know, create, delete, update, oh sorry, create, uh, update, and, and delete, yeah, um, is actually the most unintuitive one, because the cost to process a single mutating request is actually one. But we have to factor in the potential watch events that will be propagated um, based on that one mutating request. So the, the more like watches you have for that object, then there is a kind of when you mutate the object, you're going to send the watch events to all the all the clients that are watching for the object. And so you have to figure out like how to actually put a cost to that um, propagated watch events. Uh, so the formula we used for mutating events was uh, W divided by 25, where W is the number of watchers for, for that object. Uh, so, uh, how does the API server actually know the values of n and w? Uh, it's nothing really fancy. We basically run like a small controller inside the API server that is periodically checking for number of objects per resource in etcd and also keeping track of, of number of watchers um, watching for specific types of, of, of resources and, and namespaces. Okay, so in practice, these heuristics, um, they're not perfect. But they're kind of a they're a pretty significant improvement from just giving like every single request the cost for, um, and they they do have some 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 known limitations. So starting with list requests, um, one limitation is that um, we don't actually factor in namespaces. So the object tracker basically tracks total object count on a per resource basis, um, and basically like you know if if you have like a thousand config maps and they're all in, you know, like 900 are in one namespace and the other hundred are divided across other namespaces. If, if you list config maps in the namespace with like five objects, uh, we're always gonna treat 
the amount of config maps as basically a thousand. So like obviously, um, this is can be problematic, but in practice, it's actually not a big deal because listing five config maps, even if we associate a high cost with it, because we process the request so quickly, it usually ends up kind of being negligible. But there are some cases where, where it has been problematic. Um, another limitation is that we don't factor in the size of the request, because obviously the size determines like how much work is involved in, in serialization. So um, that's something we, we currently don't factor in at all. Um, for, for mutating requests, uh, the watch tracker, um, I, I guess the biggest limitation is that it, it's only tracking watchers that are local to the same API server, um, and it's not actually like communicating with the other API servers on the actual total amount of um, watches. So it's, it's actually not a complete accurate measurement of the actual like watch events that you propagate for, for mutating requests. And then the other limitation is that uh, not all watch events are actually equal in work. So we don't, uh, we don't actually account for that. Like some watch events might trigger like more logical changes in your system, whereas you know, some other watch events might just be like, you know, uh, making a, like just like sending a log event or something like that. So we don't actually care about um, the actual work by watch events, we just treat all watch events kind of the, kind of the same. Uh, so yeah, let's go through some examples. Um, let's say we have a list request for config maps uh, in the default namespace. So let's say a cluster has uh, 600 config maps, but the request specifies resource version zero, which means list from cache. So the cost is going to be, um, so earlier I mentioned we basically limit the amount of seats to 10. So the cost is going to be the lower of either uh, 10 uh, or N over 100. So the cost in this case is gonna be six. Um, if we take the same example and then we remove the resource version zero, now this becomes a list from storage and so uh, N over uh, 100 times two is 12, but because we have the upper limit of 10, the cost is gonna be 10. Um, so uh, one problem we actually ran into uh, in GKE, so at some point we like upgraded to a version where list requests don't cost one anymore, but now they cost up to 10. Uh, we can have scenarios where the cost of a request is actually more than the actual available capacity. Um, so earlier we talked about how priority levels they're given like some share of the total max requests in flight based on the nominal concurrency shares. But if you configure like a really low max in flight request, um, you, you can end up with priority levels that have less than 10 seats, but, the, but you can have a request come in that costs 10 seats. And so you can have basically one request that effectively starves out the whole priority level uh, and um, basically locks out the other clients from, from uh, at least until like the request completes. Uh, and so more recently, um, we kind of tuned this formula a little bit further such that we take um, the smaller of either the estimated cost or 15% of the uh, total available seats. Um, but, we, but we still apply this upper limit of 10 because we, we don't want like the, uh, the seats to kind of, like you can have clusters that have like tens of thousands of, of, of objects and we don't want any single request to basically cost more than 10. Um, and yeah, this just makes it more likely for a handful of clients or a handful of requests to basically like completely starve out a, a priority level. Um, so yeah, this, this tuning helped quite a bit, but if we go back to the way we configure like the max request and flight flag, um, and again, these are just made up numbers to illustrate a point, we, we started to notice this pattern where like control planes with really small max requests in flight were still pretty um, prone to premature rate limiting. So like they would start rate limiting clients thinking the cluster is overloaded, but the cluster actually has like a lot of capacity left. And then for our like really large control planes, like the control planes that are managing like your 5,000 to 15,000 node clusters, um, they had too much max requests in flight. So they, they weren't actually providing like sufficient overload protection. And we had, we could, you could have scenarios where cluster gets overloaded by some clients that aren't actually that important. And so we started to think about um, different ways we can calculate the most appropriate values for max requests in flight. And we landed on applying this like weighted function such that the first few cores by the control plane give more max requests in flight. And then as you like add more uh, CPU capacity, we kind of like taper it off. And so when you get to like really large sizes, you don't actually add more max requests in flight if you give it more, more capacity. Um, 
so the, the effect of this is that we basically provide more upfront capacity if, when we start the control plane smaller. Um, and, and this way, they're less likely to uh, like lock out clients and rate limit clients uh, prematurely. And we also like restrict the max requests in flight for really large control planes because you know, th these are typically your like, really large GKE clusters. And we need to always make sure that there's available capacity to scale the nodes. And, and we don't want like, non-system clients competing with the scheduler and, and, and the controller manager and like, other system clients that are trying to basically keep this like, 5,000 node cluster running. Um, so yeah, this is, bas this is basically to illustrate kind of what the max request in flight will look like as, as a cluster kind of scales to more nodes. Okay, so, so far uh, uh, we accomplished, um, we basically added like a mechanism to limit uh, in-flight requests using the max request in-flight flag. And then we introduced this API to define priorities and a way to classify traffic into these priorities. And then we introduced um, work estimation and tuned that a bunch so that we make the system more robust and it kind of more accurately measures the amount of work that's produced um, by, by incoming requests. So we're at a pretty good place at this point, but there's, this, there's a really big underlying assumption that we've been making so far that isn't always true, which is that clients and the requests are always going to the correct prior level, right? Um, and so this is where uh, flow classification um, is relevant. So earlier we briefly covered the, the flow schema API, which is basically a, a set of rules and that maps some parameters of a request into a priority level. And if you don't have the correct flow schemas or an optimal configuration of flow schemas, your system availability and performance is, is going to suffer. Uh, and this is because we've designed these priority levels around uh, specific clients and, and, and the types of requests that we actually expect from those clients. Um, but if these requests are not mapping correctly to those priority levels, then you know, we're going to run into a lot of problems because we, we, we kind of designed the priority levels like we basically sharded capacity to these priority levels based on what uh, like you know specific types of clients, and now if we're not expecting that, the the shares of the priority levels are, are incorrect. Uh, and so uh, Kubernetes does come with some uh, sane default flow schemas, which are designed to cover most cases. Uh, so uh, looking at uh, one example, uh, the first one. Uh, all clients authenticated with a Kubernetes service account is going to use the workload low priority level. And like earlier in that like donut chart, the workload load actually has the um, most capacity. And this is because generally if you're running a pod with the mounted service account, that's gonna be a controller. And in large clusters, you're gonna have lots of controllers running in this configuration, which is why it has the, the, uh, the most capacity. Um, uh, uh, but if you're actually running a service account in the kube system namespace, we actually treat it a more of a system controller, and so we, we put that into the workload high. And workload high is basically, like you can think of like workload low is all controllers, and workload high is all system controllers, basically. And uh, yeah, there's a bunch of other rules similar to that that I'm, I'm not going to cover. Actually, the, the last one is, pro is probably worth calling out. So this is the global default priority level, which is given a pretty small slice of the cake, and we reserve that for uh, interactive clients like Cube Control and, and, and whatnot. And this will be important later, for, for example. Um, yeah, so in GKE, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have some goals around uh, flow classification. Uh, so firstly, we want to improve the uh, overall accuracy of flow classification, which means we want to configure our flow schemas in such a way that misclassifying flows is very unlikely. And then secondly, we want our default configuration of flow schemas um, and priority levels to work for every GK user. And so we want, uh, so we do allow customizing flow schemas and priority levels with some guardrails, but we want that to be a last resort. Um, and we want it to be like a fairly, low, fairly uh, rare occurrence for um, any GK user to have to kind of tinker with flow schemas and priority levels. Um, uh, but in, in practice, this actually becomes um, really hard to accomplish because of all the different way our customers set up the cluster and deploy their applications and all the different ways you can like authenticate and, and interact with your cluster. And so uh, misclassification actually becomes uh, uh, kind of inevitable at, 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 to some extent. Um, so yeah, let's walk through some examples of a misclassification that can happen on GKE. So very common example is you run 
uh, some local tool on your laptop that generates a lot of traffic. Uh, these clients will almost always use the global default priority level that we kind of talked about earlier. Um, and this is because usually when you run some controller or, or some tool on your laptop, it's going to authenticate, uh, pro most likely it's going to authenticate in the same way that you would like with your kube control, right? It's going to point the kube config environment variable to your kube config. Um, and it's going to, uh, but, but the difference is that like it's going to generate a lot more traffic than you would with kube control, right? Like kube control is basically, you know, you run single commands that are, you know, list pods or delete pods or whatever. But if you run like a dashboard, for example, using the same kube config, it's going to basically try to like list the whole world just to show you like a nice like UI for your cluster, right? So very different traffic pattern compared to those two things. Another example is. Um, yeah, like uh, you run a controller uh, on a GCE VM that's like not part of your GK cluster. Uh, that's also going to use global default because it's uh, probably going to be authenticated using a Google service account and not a Kubernetes service account. So generally, we want any non-system control, non controllers to use um, the workload low priority level like we discussed earlier. Uh, some third-party add-ons will run controllers in the kube system namespace, um, which puts traffic uh, in the workload high priority level. Um, and like that's obviously bad because you know, well it's not always bad, but it can be bad because workload high is shared with the scheduler, the controller manager, and whatnot. And you don't want to accidentally put a high load controller in the same priority as those uh, as those system components because that can really um, mess up your cluster. And so like yeah, like these are just some examples, but like you can think of more scenarios, and like it, it quickly becomes impossible to cover all the different cases of, of misclassification. So instead of trying to chase all these corner cases, we need to kind of make this, the system a little bit more resilient to this misclassification. And so this is where uh, priority borrowing becomes really important. Uh, so this was introduced in uh, 126. And as the name suggests, uh, priority borrowing is a way for the API server to lend unused capacity from one priority level to another. So this allows for the uh, available capacity in any priority level to be more flexible, and it prevents uh, few clients from starving out entire uh, priority levels. And so the, the neatest thing about uh, borrowing is that it, it, it actually allows us to better, use, better utilize unused capacity in the control plane. Uh, but in the event of overload, everything's going to kind of self-correct to what, whatever fixed capacity that we gave it. So optimistically, it'll always try to use like all the unavailable capacity in the other priority levels. And then if you kind of reach a tipping point, everything will kind of just be using the fixed priority that you've kind of assigned it, um, ignoring kind of borrowing configurations. Um, and so yeah, for, for reference, uh, within each priority level, there's two fields that you can tune. Um, the borrowing limit percent, which is the amount you can borrow from the other priority levels. And then lendable percent, lendable percent is the amount other priority levels can borrow from you, right? So we can kind of like tune these values so that, uh, for example, like uh, we might not, we actually, there, there are some priority levels where we absolutely don't want to let other priority levels borrow from it no matter what. And so these are values that we can kind of tune. Um, and yeah, luckily in GKE, we haven't actually had to tune this at all. Like the defaults have been working great, but uh, it's probably too, so too soon to say at this point. We might, we might need to revisit this. Okay, so. Uh, I think we're running out of time. So really quickly, uh, do you want to talk about webhooks? So webhooks can denial of service your, your control plane, um, as many of you probably already know. So especially webhooks that use uh, wildcard matches, right? Um, and this is, webhooks are, I'm very conflicted about webhooks because oftentimes webhooks serve very valuable pur purpose, right? Whether it's policy control or, you know, sidecar injection, whatever. And we can't, a lot of times, like, we can't just, like, turn them off, right? Because, um, you know, you, you're, obviously, you're installing the webhook for a valuable reason. Um, and also, there's kind of this, like, shared responsibility between GKE and our customers. Like, if you deploy a webhook, you're basically extending the control plane. But, like, we're not, we can't manage the actual, like, services that are back in the webhook. Um, so what we've done is we built some systems at Google to provide some more um, proactive uh, insights and recommendations to customers to let them know about webhooks that we think pose some potential risk um, to the control plane. Um, 
so if, if you use GK for a while, you, you, you might actually be familiar with this. So we actually do this for, um, for example, for deprecated APIs. If your cluster is using some deprecated API and you're about to upgrade to a version that removes those deprecated APIs, we actually have like a bunch of UI that tells you like, hey, like you're using your, your cluster, we detected that your cluster is using a deprecated API um, and we're gonna block your upgrades until you kind of resolve this. And we kind of use that same system um, to, to kind of look, look at webhooks and say like, hey, this webhook is intercepting uh, like leases in the cube node lease uh, namespace and you, your webhook is in the critical path of like node heartbeats, for example. And so we actually, um, have this uh, detection mechanism now to proactively let customers know about the webhooks. Um, so yeah, this is the, this example. So yeah, if we detect um, unavailab unavailability of a service back in your webhook, we have this UI that pops up. Um, so the earlier slide shows, this is the, I read, I, sorry, I redacted a bunch of stuff, um, but th this is like the Kubernetes cluster list, right? And then there's this notification column that has a bunch of like warnings. So like, uh, the API dep deprecations would be one example, or like the recent Docker shim deprecation would be, would be another one. But we have a specific like warning for webhooks now. And if you click that, it'll either show one of these two kind of warnings. One is uh, if you reference a service for a webhook and that service was down for some amount of time, we'll actually tell you like, hey, you're, you, know, you have a webhook in your cluster and the service is, is not available. And so we, we have some like docs to help you troubleshoot those kind of situations. Uh, and then, yeah, if we detect webhooks that intercept um, what we deem as like system critical resources, then we'll, we'll provide some recommendations to uh, update your webhook to exclude those namespaces. Um, so yeah, takeaway is that webhooks can take, out, take down your cluster and there are some best practices that you can follow. So mainly uh, ensure the webhook has sufficient capacity and run m multiple replicas if you can. Uh, don't intercept um, system critical requests. So some examples are like lease traffic in cube node lease or lease traffic in cube system, right? Because uh, those are used for leader election for uh, uh, system components, um, things like that. And you can actually um, use a namespace selector field in the, in the webhook configuration to actually exclude entire namespaces. And then more recently in, in 1.28, we introduced um, match conditions. So you can use like cell expression rules to basically uh, exclude, um, uh, or like you can basically use a uh, cell to basically like filter out um, or decide when you should invoke the webhook or not. Um, and this is actually a, a feature that we've built with some, some folks uh, working on EKS because we're both looking into ways to reduce the blast radius uh, of webhooks. And yeah, that concludes my talk. Um, yeah, happy to take questions if there are any. Oh, thanks, by the way. Sorry, I like kind of rushed the talking to the end because I didn't want to run out of time for questions. All right, cool. Thanks for attending. Appreciate it. I'll also be like by the hallway if anyone wants to like chat about any of this stuff. <laughs>